Next speaker is Sally Armstrong, and her interest is uh, in stories about women and girls in zones of conflict. In Bosnia, Somalia, Rwanda, Afghanistan, she's been there. She says, I love stories that not only involve me emotionally, but stories that move you to act. Sally? How are you? Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. It's marvelous to be here. And I have an idea for you. It is about women, women who live in countries all over the world, but mostly in zones of conflict. Something is happening. There's a change out there. Remember the peace movement and the women's movement and the gay rights movement and the black rights movement? Well, what I see happening out there now is kind of like Pete Seeger and Doris Anderson and Harvey Milk and Martin Luther King all rolled into one. It has to do with women. And I believe the earth is moving and it's a seismic move and it's all about change. And I believe that change is being directed by women and it's only just starting. So we can all get in on it right at the beginning. As Moses said, I'm a journalist, I work in zones of conflict, and my beat is to find out what happens to women and girls in those pretty dangerous places. As he mentioned, I spent an awful lot of time in Afghanistan, but I'm just back from Swaziland, and before that, Nairobi, and, and before that, Congo. You know, I've been doing these kinds of stories for more than two decades. And you would like to think that change comes to the world via women because we've decided to be decent, or maybe we've decided to obey the law, maybe even observe the international treaties that every single country, including those countries in conflict, have signed. But it's not about any of that. You know what it's about? It's about money. And what we're discovering right now is the economy is the ticket that women can ride. And if the rest of the world is smart, they're going to jump on board and join this journey. And it's going to be women and the economy that lead places that are in trouble out of their conflict. Places like Afghanistan, the Middle East, and Africa. Now, you may think that's a bit of a reach, but as I said, my beat is to go there and to tell their stories. And for these last more than two decades, while I told the stories, I saw a change happening. But in the last year, the change is extraordinary. And the examples being given to us are indisputable. For example, in Congo right now, I was there in December on assignment. It's unbelievable to me we're not talking more about Congo. Five million people dead. Those are World War II numbers. Nobody's talking about it. 200,000 women gang raped. Nobody's talking about it. And the atrocities, it may be too early in the morning to, to describe them to you, but take my word for it. This is a loss of civility. This is like the Lord of the Flies going on. But the point I want to make to you about the economy is that food production in Congo has dropped by 70%. Imagine, this is a country with soil so rich you could kick a seed into the ground and have a crop by the weekend. But the... the <laughs> but the food production has dropped. Why? Because the women are the planters. And the women have been so sexually assaulted, gang raped, re-raped, mass raped, raped with broken beer bottles, breasts slashed off with machetes, honest to God, that they're too afraid to go to the fields to plant or simply unable. So food production dropped. So the World Food Program had to come in with food for 70% of the country. Who do you think's paying for that? You are. We all are. So suddenly, the treatment of women has to do with the worldwide economy. You know, the World Bank has been doing studies every five years since 1985 to show if you treat the women in the village fairly, the economy will turn around. But you know what? Nobody really listened. They talked about it in, in fancy conferences, but it didn't change the facts on the ground. But now, Uber economists like Jeffrey Sachs, you know, the World Millennium Goals guy, he is now saying, wherever he goes, that the status of women and the economy 
are directly linked one to the other. So where one is flourishing, so is the other. Where one's in the tank, so is the other. Now, I dare say a grade 10 student in Toronto could have already told you that. But once you get people like Jeffrey Sachs saying it, it certainly alters the rhetoric. I bet you nobody ever suggested to you that your safety or even your wallet was linked to the status of women. I believe it is. But I guess the thing that astonishes me is that it's taken so long for us to come to this point. Why did we, did, did we not see the atrocities, the violence, the issues around women as something that affected the whole world, the health of the world, the economy of the world? I want to tell you a story about how I got involved in, in focusing my career on those things. It was in 1992. I was in Sarajevo doing a story on the effect of war on children. That was my story. It was the day before I was to leave Sarajevo, and you know, you never knew if you were leaving. For those of you who remembered reading it in those days, we used to call it maybe airlines. Maybe you'd leave, maybe you wouldn't. It depended on whether or not they were rocketing the airport. But I was leaving the next morning, I hoped, and I started to hear rumors about rape camps and that they were rounding up the women of the enemy and, and raping them in these camps. And you know, journalists learn early on, one of the first casualties of war is the truth. And when I first heard that, remember this is before Congo, before Rwanda, I thought, surely to God this is one of the casualties of war, surely this can't be happening. But all day I kept hearing it from more and more credible sources. And by the end of the day, I thought, this is happening. This horrible crime is actually happening. Now, I work for magazines, usually. I had a piece in the Globe last Saturday in the focus section, but normally I work for magazines. I can rush a story to press in about three months. So this was a news story, and I decided I would get everything I could, and I would take it with me back to Canada the next day and give it to a news agency. So I gathered names, mobile phone numbers, anecdotes, everything I could. And when I came home, I went directly from the airport to a news agency, I won't say which one, because I believe it would have happened at any one, and I handed over the data. I said, give this to one of your reporters. This is an extraordinary story. And I went home and waited for the headline. Nothing. Two days, three days, a week, nothing. Seven weeks later, there was a four-line blurb in Newsweek magazine. I phoned the guy I gave the data to. And he nervously began laughing when he heard my voice. He said, oh, Sally, <laughs> I knew you'd be calling me today. I saw that four-line blurb in Newsweek magazine. I said, what happened? He said, well, it's a it was a great story. I mean, I was really grateful you brought us the story, and I was going to assign it, you know. But, you know, I put it up on the shelf, and, you know, I got busy, and, you know, I got on deadline, and, you know, I forgot. I said to him, 20,000 women were gang-raped eight and ten times a day, some of them eight years old, some of them 80 years old, and you forgot? Well, you know, he said. And that day, I decided I was going to make these stories my focus. In fact, I went back to my team, and the, that time as the editor-in-chief of Homemakers Magazine, my editor said, why don't we do it? I said, well, it's going to take us three months, for heaven's sakes. I was on a plane two days later, got the story, we published it. I'm embarrassed to say I won every award on the planet for that story, but I'm not surprised that Homemakers Magazine was the first one to break the story of the gang raping of women in the Balkans. It was a huge lesson to me, and as I said, that's when I decided I was going to make a difference through telling women's stories. You know, there's this bizarre duality in much of the world that women are, on the one hand, are these fragile creatures that need to be protected, and on the other hand, they're evil Jezebels that society needs to be protected from. And the reason for that stupid kind of thinking is that we allow people to say things that we know are wrong, but we dare not dispute. Look at the Taliban. Here's a gang of thugs who hijacked their own religion for political opportunism. They claimed they were acting in the name of God. There's not one word in the Quran to support what they did. There's no place in the Quran that says a woman can't go to work or a girl can't go to school or even that you have to cover your face. 
But they got away with it because the rest of the world was too afraid to speak up. You see, when someone says to you, you don't come from here, you're not part of our religion, you're not part of our culture, it's none of your business. Well, we tend to back off. And you know, it is our business. What was happening to the women of Afghanistan was not cultural, it was criminal. And it was high time, in my opinion, that somebody spoke up about this. You know, let me give you an example. That the first time I was there, a young woman had been married. She obeyed all their stupid rules that, that she had to wear a burqa, that she couldn't leave the house with, unless she was in the company of a husband, brother, or son. Um, she'd had a manicure for her wedding. Her wedding was just the day before the Taliban crashed into Kabul in September 1996. She wore the burqa. She didn't leave the house without her husband, but she didn't take off her manicure. And these monsters saw her on the street, the Taliban, and they chopped off her fingertips. That's who was running this country while the world looked the other way, saying, it's not my business, it's somebody else's culture. You know, the fundamentalists will tell you that's about righteousness. But women the world over know that the misogynist acts used against them in the name of culture, in the name of religion, not cultural or religious at all. They're misogynist. And yet, we never seem to speak enough about that. Now, women's groups are forming in certainly all the countries where I'm covering conflict. And they're the ones who are making change. In Congo, can you believe it? These women are hiding in the forest. The, these roving militias have burned down their villages, raped the women, the men have run off. Here are the women hiding in the forest trying to get a piece of food for their kids. But they're going to work. And they're the only ones that can change it. Only the women who live in the place can make the change. We can help, we can send money, we can advise, but it's only the people on the ground who can change. So in Congo, they've got signs all over the place in the forest, for heaven's sakes. Silence is violence. You see, there's a taboo about speaking of these things. And if you can't talk about it, you can't change it. Look what happened in Afghanistan. Remember when President Karzai signed the Shia family law last year? All of a sudden, the world did respond. And they said, we can't support you if you're going to support this. But more than that, it was the women of Afghanistan who took it on. They marched. That wouldn't have happened a year ago. They demanded a meeting with Karzai and got it. That wouldn't have happened a year ago. They demanded changes in the law. None of those things would have happened. I believe very strongly that Afghanistan is at a tipping point today. The, the changes are going to start to roll out, and I believe it is because of the women who are these reformers. I strongly believe after 13 years of reporting out of Afghanistan, it is the women who are going to yank this primitive country into the 21st century. And there's support for these kinds of changes all over the place. The United Nations, for example, has now, or the, the Security Council at the UN, which is even bigger, they've declared rape a security issue. They say rape is a strategy of war. We've known that forever, haven't we? But again, like Jeffrey Sachs saying that the economy is hooked to women, the Security Council finally coming to terms with rape being a strategy of war. These are the kinds of things that move people forward. You know, they also made the resolution 1325 more than 10 years ago. And that resolution said that women would be at every negotiating table. And imagine how much they have to contribute. If we cut this room in half and said, we've got serious problems in the world, but we only want to know the solutions from you. From you, we don't want any solutions. You know, what a stupid thing to do. And that's what we've been doing for all these many, many years. You know, I've just been appointed to a, an organization called the International Women's Commission. And it's 20 Palestinian women, 20 Israeli women, 10 international women. Our mandate is the Middle East. And I thought, it really is coming together when finally a terrible problem that no one's been able to solve is now put into the hands of women. Wish us luck, because I believe there is something we can do with that. You know, <laughs> I, I want to give you other examples of these changes that are going on in the world. 
um, the story that I did for the Globe last, last Saturday was about a meeting that took place in Nairobi. Now, get a load of this. You know, as Canadians, we're, we're a little bit shy. We keep our light hidden under a bushel. Well, eight Canadian women human rights lawyers got together with eight African women human rights lawyers to find out why human rights for African women or the status of women in Africa hasn't budged in the last three decades. Well, it's basically become the new panacea every place else. They figured out why. And then they said, well, you know what? We don't have any time to spare. We, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We're going to use the method the Canadian women used in the early 80s. Some of you might remember the way Canadian women did this was they reformed the law. They changed the law, they educated the judiciary, judiciary, and then they increased awareness among the public. And that's what these African women human rights lawyers have decided to do. And they started with three countries, Kenya, Malawi, and Ghana, with a program called Three to be Free. Three years using those three strategies to alter the status of women in three countries. I believe they'll do it. I believe the world is ripe for this kind of a change. And I'm just back from Swaziland, where I was covering the March of the Grandmothers. Perhaps you heard about it. The grandmothers in Africa are raising their orphan grandchildren because their own sons and daughters are dead in the AIDS pandemic. They're suffering, they're poor, they have nothing to go with. And they decided to march because they said, we are the future of Africa. And I believe they are. And once again, it's being led by women. So as much as there's bad news about women, there always is, wherever you go, it keeps me in business telling their stories. But I see this powerful coming together of half the world's population, and they're the ones that are going to come to the table, and I believe they're going to lead us to the other side. Thank you for listening. It was a pleasure to be here with you this morning. Thank you. Sally, of course, everything that you say is beyond true, but why focus only on Afghanistan when we have it right here in our own society? Here's a story yesterday that just sent chills through me. It says, Canada should expect rise in honor killings, expert says. Moses, this is exactly the, the movement that I hope people are hooking on to. Imagine to murder your own daughter and call it honor. And what and is the, the women's movement in Canada doing? They're busily defending the right of a woman well, you know to what? wear the niqab in a court. I heard, um, I heard a woman say that yesterday, that it was the women's movement in Canada. Leaf. I'm the women's movement in Canada. Leaf is, is uh, well, we all are, aren't we? And, and, and I, I think that's a bit of a misnomer. Leaf has gone to court to defend a woman's right to decide what she wants to do. Leaf would be the last place on the planet who would ever support. But the thing about honor killing is most of us wanted to back off because when that young girl was killed in Canada, there was a great hue and cry. What are you going to do? Go around accusing everybody. You can't be calling it honor killing. And someone phoned me to interview me. And I said, I'm not familiar with the case. I'm in no position to judge. But from what I've read, sounds like an honor killing to me. I think we have to begin calling things for the way we see them. We are against honor killing. End of story. Here, here. How many know how many of those have already occurred in Canada? Let me hear it. A dozen? This year? In any case. And those are only much, the ones Sally. you know about. That's right. That's right. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, Sally. You. Thank you. Thank you.